Good morning, everybody. Hope y'all are well. Hey, if you're out in the atrium, come on in and grab a seat. Go ahead and take a minute and say hello to somebody around you. Greet them on this Master's Sunday. We've got some beautiful weather outside. Say hello. We want to cultivate family here. Yeah, if you're out in the atrium, go ahead and make your way in. We're going to begin in worship today. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, I'd love that. My name is Alan. I'm the campus pastor here at the Anderson campus. Love doing church with you guys. Love, hey Ty, love the opportunity that I have to serve and to be a part of this with you. Um, hey, I know that we've had a lot of people plugging in since Easter. And so if you're new here, I just wanted to point you to the guest services desk. It's right down this uh, I was going to say alley. This isn't an alley because it's not enclosed. So you walk out this walkway and the guest services desk is right out that way. We'd love the opportunity to meet you. You'll see some of our staff and volunteers out there with name tags. Um, and I just wanted to share a story with you briefly before we get started this morning. You guys can stand up. We got like half the room standing, half the room not. So let's just all do the same thing. We'll just all do the same thing because, you know, we're family and all those things. So yesterday morning, I'm out at uh, the new YMCA sports complex right out here. Uh, and I grew up playing ball at Duckworth. And my youngest is pitching the opening game of the, the yeah, hey, thank you for that. Come on, Wyatt. Boy, he slung it too. But that's not the point of the story. That's not, that, way to go, Wyatt. Love you. But, I mean, four innings, one hit, he was on. But what I thought about was, so I grew up pitching at Duckworth and my dad always stood behind the backstop. And I would look and my dad's there and he's smiling. And I mean, I could chuck it over the backstop and he'd be smiling and I could throw 10 strikes in a row and he'd be smiling. And I'm standing behind the backstop yesterday watching my boy pick pitch. And I thought about this legacy that I've had the privilege of stepping into uh, as a person who's a part of the Cothran family. And I was thinking about how that relates to us as the Christian family, as the bride of Christ and the legacy we have to together step into what God has for us. A loving father watching over us, smiling at the fact that his children are gathering together to worship. And so that's the posture that I wanna invite you into today, that there's a loving father who is standing behind you, watching and smiling as you return worship back to him. And so I hope you come in here read up in 1 Corinthians after last week. I hope you come in here prayed up and ready to worship God. And so I'm gonna pray for us right now and invite us to return thanks to a God who's given us every good gift that he had to give. So Father, we are grateful this morning what a privilege to do this together alongside brothers and sisters, spiritual family, one with another, Lord, worshiping you and thanking you for all that you've done for us. And so, Lord, cultivate that sense of family this morning. God, we ask that you would make us one. As you are one with your Son and your Spirit, Lord, make us one today. And so right now, we return that thanks to you through worship. And all God's people said, Amen. Glad y'all are here this morning. Yes, we are here. Jesus is Lord. He sits on the throne. And we are not here to watch. We're here to participate with heaven and what Jesus is doing in the kingdom. So let's sing and lift our voices this morning. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our song. Your breath. Let your breath come from heaven, 
Just as, as Greg was singing that, I was just thinking, I just want to point out the truth of God's word that says that you are a holy temple. If you know Jesus, it's not that we're saying, I mean, yes, we are saying, God, you're welcome like here in this building, but no, God, you are welcome here. So would you just say that like, God, you're welcome here. Out of all the places he chose to be, the Holy Spirit's dwelling place, he says, right here which means through Jesus, he makes you holy. He wouldn't have chosen a temple that wasn't holy. Think about that. So as we throw up our hands to him and worship, we can worship because he is dwelling here. And God, we do, we welcome your presence. Yes, in this environment, but you say where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so where the spirit of the Lord is inside of every worshiper, may there be freedom to approach your throne. God, you are welcome here. Jesus name.
with open hearts. We are ready to hear you speak. We're fully surrendered. You say, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. God, we are fully surrendered to you. Yielded to your words. Would you speak them to us in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. These are questions that people are asking about the church in America right now. These are all reasons people are asking. Where is the hope? 
these issues that disunify and threaten the church today are the same things that did so to the church in Corinth when Paul visited them and said, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Paul called them to a gospel-centered definition of truth, unity, and love. Hope is found in an undivided church. And now a reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Well, hello and good morning, New Spring family on all of our campuses. It's sunshiny, it's Master's Weekend, and you're in church. Why don't you put your hands together and welcome everybody on all of our campuses, those joining us online. We're so grateful to have you here. Uh, we're in our second week in a series on 1 Corinthians, so I want to go ahead and invite you to open up your Bibles to uh, the end of chapter 4 and all of chapter 5. We're going to get in the Word of God today. If you want to open up the New Spring app, we'll have all the notes preloaded for you there. And I want to do a little bit of celebrating because last week I had the chance to, uh, like you, sit and receive the Word, but I got to do it in a couple of different campuses. I got to hang out over with our Greenville campus last week on Thursday night. Y'all, the, the Greenville campus doesn't have enough room, so they opened up a Thursday night service, and it was awesome to be there with you over in Greenville. Uh, so grateful for our Greenville crew. And then also last weekend, uh, into spring break for my, my family, I ran down to Bluffton and hung out for a 36 hours with our Bluffton campus, got to do church down there with Pastor Jason and the team. And it was so good to be with our, our church family across the state. If you're new with us, we've got 13 campuses. We're one church in 13 locations, and, and God uses the unity of our church to not just impact cities, but, but it's our heart to see the entire state of South Carolina changed and shifted and moved because of the way that we're walking and following King Jesus. Our vision is to see everyone everywhere in an everyday relationship. So we wanna just welcome you. If you are new to New Spring Church, we're glad that you're here. Maybe you came at Easter and you're back again. We're pumped for that. Uh, some of the New Spring family knows this, but tomorrow morning we send out an email it's our most popular email. The open rate on this is higher than anything else that we've got. It's called the need to know email. It's got all kinds of things that are happening globally and things that happen specific to your campus. And you told us in the census that you wanted more info. Well, tomorrow you're gonna get some more info. So here's what I want you to do. If you don't already receive the need to know email, I want you to take your phone out real quick and just text the phrase need to know to 30303. Let me tell you why. Every quarter, and tomorrow is the end of quarter one, start of quarter two, you're gonna to get to hear from our lead team uh, in, a, in a specific instance, our elder update. So tomorrow morning, we've got an elder update. We wish we had more time right here to communicate more information, but we're saving that for the email, all right? So make sure you're signed up so you'll see it. We've got some big news that we wanna tell you about at a couple of our campuses, uh, specifically across the state. And, and one of those is in Aiken. And just as a matter of fact, it's not every day you have this, but Anderson campus, we actually have our Aiken campus pastor here in the room. So would you guys put your hands together and welcome Pastor Matt and his, his wife, Nikki Stillman. They're hanging out with us. Uh, uh, this is a smart move, actually. They Airbnb'd their home down there in Aiken because it's Augusta week. And so they were able to make, make like five mortgage payments, okay, with one week of Airbnb. I, that's a complete lie. I have no idea. But we're, we're glad to have them down here sitting on the front row. So Aiken campus, thanks for lending us Matt and Nikki for the week and, uh, and their family. So anyway, I've, I've taken up too much time. Uh, let's jump in. How many of you, you were able to take the, the three-point challenge uh, not three-point challenge, but three-point challenge that uh, Pastor Lee McDermott laid out last week. Do you remember what it was? Challenge number one, we were gonna all read what? We were gonna read? Corinthians. Yeah, First Corinthians. And so you were able to do that this week or listen to it, or maybe you still gotta finish it up today. So well done. Challenge number two was you were gonna be at church every week. So go ahead and give your neighbor a high five. You did it. Well done. You made it to church uh, this week. And then challenge number three, does anybody remember what challenge number three was? We're gonna pray a prayer, three, three, three word prayer. We're gonna pray, make us one. So why don't you go ahead and write that down? And it was an awesome thing to stand last week at the end of service uh, in Greenville, in Bluffton. I was sitting where you are and got to hold hands across the campuses and pray the prayer, make us one. And that is the primary arc and point of the book of 1 Corinthians, unity. Uh, my sister Meredith said this years ago, it sticks with me. If, if unity is one of the last things Jesus prayed for in the garden before he went to the cross, it's one of the things that we're gonna have to fight for. And we have got to 
really work hard at, at being made one. So today the title of this message is Fight for Unity. Fight for Unity. And uh, last week, Lee, just by background, told us that in Corinth, the background of Corinth was like three American cities. Do you guys remember the three cities that Corinth was like? It was, it was a lot like New York, New York City, and it was a lot like Los Angeles, Hollywood, and then when the last one was, it was a lot like Vegas. Vegas. All right, y'all were here. And it's kind of those three all swirled into one. Well, I'm gonna tell you that the, the, real, the real kickers, I wanna give you another city. I wanna bring New York, Vegas, and LA to a little South Carolina town, a town that we all enjoy. And I think this town is gonna give us some solutions to what ails New York LA in Vegas. That town is Charleston, South Carolina, and I want to put a bridge behind me on the screen that, that is going to be my, my main point today. And some of y'all are like, yeah, that's why we relocated here. We came to South Carolina. You're like political refugees. You just got here, maybe the last couple of years. You just keep coming. And you're welcome, by the way, but you know. Come on, let's keep it going. All right, you're welcome, by the way. Uh, but this is the Charleston Cooper River Bridge. Uh, last week, it had tens of thousands of people running across it. Uh, I found that out because on the way back from Bluffton, it took us like 4X the time to get back to our house because everybody was leaving from the Cooper River Bridge run. Did anybody run the Cooper River Bridge run this week? Right here in the middle, right here, right here. Okay, Greenville Campus had some folks too. Well done, y'all, you did it. Uh, the Cooper River Bridge run, here's what I want though. The Cooper River Bridge is a tension bridge. And this is my primary point all day today. It's a tension bridge and a tension bridge requires what to work? It requires, not a trick question, tension. Awesome. And so you've got tension on both sides of the tension bridge. And I want you to know that what we've got to understand as we jump into 1 Corinthians, end of chapter 4, beginning of chapter 5, is that the Bible is full of truth in tension. And one of the, one of the pitfalls uh, of reading the scripture is you can get in a ditch on one side of truth in tension or the other, and you can pit the two against each other. You can make false dichotomies. And what Paul's about to do today in 1 Corinthians and all through the book, you're gonna see him correcting false dichotomies where people had embraced one truth of the scripture, but had forgotten the other. And the specific truth that you're gonna see again and again and again in the book of 1 Corinthians and all over the New Testament is the truth intention is that we've got to both hold grace and truth vigorously in tension. And one of the correctives, and maybe you've seen this in your own life, is that maybe you grew up in a place, every one of us did, by the way, in a culture, a context, or we even in our own hearts, we are on a spectrum where we kind of lean one way or the other on the grace and truth intention spectrum. I can tell you very honestly, Firstborn type A, rule follower, I land on the truth side pretty quickly. Now, what I'm gonna say is not capital T truth here. I'm gonna start referring to it as lowercase t. I'm, I'm a little bit truthy if I'm left in my flesh. And there's truthy churches. What I mean by that is truthy churches are all about rules and regulations. Truthy ecosystems are all about catching people doing the wrong thing. And the reason you do that is so you can show yourself off to be the one doing the right thing and you can look down at people doing the wrong thing. Anybody ever known a truthy culture like that? Show of hands. A lot of the American church over the last 50 years has been in response to that kind of legalism, that kind of Pharisee attitude and ecosystem. Now, as they've corrected in the American church, as we have corrected in the American church, one of the things we've got to recognize is our tendency is to just let go of truth altogether and run to grace. Because this is not a trick question. Is there anybody at New Spring Church this morning who is excited and willing to praise God for some grace? Come on, come on. I know we got some recovering Baptists and Presbyterians here, but Pentecostals, what do we do right here? Anybody excited about a little grace? Amen, hallelujah, praise God. I see you standing up. Okay, anyway. But what happened in the Corinthian church is in this grace culture, this bottomless grace culture, if you let go of truth, what you have is bottomless grace and bottomless grace that doesn't have a hold of truth is powerless grace. And the way you know the grace is powerless is it doesn't change people. And so if you're in a culture of grace, 
that doesn't see you or others change, you might be where the Corinthian church was. And you'll know it, as soon as we start to read this, you're gonna recognize it. Paul knew something and he went out of his way to teach this. It's a point I want you to write down that we need to get a hold of. If we just though run back over to truth and we just lean on rules and regulations without relationship, it's going to lead to rebellion. I know that's a lot of R's, alliteration. All you grammar people love it. I'm hoping you'll remember it, okay? If you have discipline minus relationship, you're gonna end up getting defiance in your culture. Parents, you feel me this on this? This is something we see in our kids. If you just discipline and you don't have relationship, you're gonna see defiance and rebellion grow in that kind of an ecosystem. Paul knew this, so he was trying very, very intentionally to make sure that he, he had established a relationship. He visited Corinth many times, and it wasn't as easy as jumping on a Delta flight. We know he visited there many times. We know he exchanged many letters with them. He loved them a lot. One of the primary things that I hope you picked up as you read 1 Corinthians this week and as you see again this upcoming week is he uses a lot of familial language. Actually, more in this letter than any other letter he writes. Paul wrote 13 of our New Testament letters and he wrote to a lot of cities, a lot of churches and he wrote two X more times in the Corinthian letters using the words brothers and sisters than any other letter. Second place, Ty, Romans and Thessalonians. They're down here at 20, almost 40 times, 39 times he uses the word brother and sister when he writes to the Corinthian church. Why? Because he's trying to make sure he emphasizes relationship. He's emphasizing love. He's emphasizing care. You complete the statement if you know it because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. He cared a ton. So as I open this up in just a minute and read, I'm asking for a little bit of empathy here. We only get little moments of time on a Sunday morning to preach the word, but I need you to know that this is a text inside of that context. And there's been ministers and pastors that are gonna take what I preach today and they have used it and maybe abused it and maybe done it inappropriately because it's, it's very firm language we're about to get into. And I hope you hear my heart, feel my heart here because I know many of you, I don't know a lot of you though. I'm gonna bring this with as much, as much gentleness as I can bring with as much fatherly compassion. But what I'm trying to do, just like you see behind me on the screen, is I'm trying desperately to not let go of truth and hold on to grace because we must live with the tension of grace and truth. Jesus came, John 1, and he was the fulfillment, the embodiment of grace and truth. And that's the kind of ecosystem we want at New Spring. Listen to me. And it's the kind of ecosystem the American church needs right now. Are you with me? If you're with me, say, I'm ready. ready. All right, so let's pick up in uh, 1 Corinthians 5. Chapter four, and we'll start reading in verse 14. All right, so listen to Paul's loving language here. So he jumps in and he says in 14, I do not write these things to make you ashamed. Okay, he's not trying to shame, but what? But to admonish you as my beloved, what? New Spring, as my beloved children. Okay, you see the language. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. All right. So I guess they had TikTok and Instagram and YouTube, a lot of Christian guides out there, but not a lot of fathering. And so he's going to show us the difference in fathering. All right. It's going to be really helpful. Not many fathers. For I became your father in Christ through the gospel. I urge you then be imitators of me. That's what a good father does. Watch me, watch me and become like me. I'm going to show you by example. And that is why I sent you Timothy my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. I sent another one of my children to, to be a good shepherd there, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So this is the culture he wants to see in all the churches. It's almost like he's using our vision statement, everyone everywhere, right here in an everyday relationship. 18, some are arrogant as though I were not coming. Pause. Did that remind anybody of like their mama saying, daddy's coming home and you better watch out. Daddy will talk to you when he gets home. Anybody else grow up in that kind of house? Show of hands. That is exactly what he's doing here, okay? So if you feel that like, oh, that's probably what they felt, all right? Some of you are arrogant, but acting like though I, I were not coming, 19, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? 
Shall I come to you with a rod, discipline, or with love in a spirit of gentleness? So a couple of things I just wanted to make sure we see. Paul is trying to do his best before he jumps in on some, some correction, some discipline, to communicate his heart. I'm coming like a dad. I'm not coming like a guide. I'm coming like a father. I love you. I can't say it enough. I love you, and I want to make sure you understand what the, the family of God looks like. I want you to understand that there is gonna be correction in the family of God, and that's okay. That, that actually the, the writer of Hebrews says that God disciplines those he loves. So where there is good discipline, we know there's also love. We need to make sure we don't allow discipline and love to not coexist. In the church context, they do. Paul's being very clear about that here. So there's three things that he's gonna now do, and I want you to write these three things down. You can look for them. He's gonna now define reality. He's gonna point out exactly what's going on. He's gonna say it very clearly. The second thing he's gonna do is he's gonna establish an expectation of accountability. And he'll move through that. And then the third thing he's gonna do is he's going to give them a hope of reconciliation. That's where he wants us to finish today. That's where he wanted the church in Corinth to finish. God wants us to understand that we have to have a culture of restorative reconciliation. As a matter of fact, he writes later in 2 Corinthians, he says, I'm gonna give you the ministry of reconciliation. He starts that groundwork here, all right? Define reality, he'll give them that, that expectation of accountability, and then he'll finish speaking towards the hope of reconciliation, okay? So that's where he's gonna start. Now, one last thing, Lee mentioned this last week. The church in Corinth was, in fact, a hot, what? It was a hot mess, you remember? It was a hot mess, and we're a hot mess, and... The only people at church today are a bunch of hot messes or former hot messes. And now we're about to see, y'all, as we open up verse one of chapter five, the hot mess, okay? Just remember I warned you, if you've been reading this week, you know exactly where it's going, all right? You ready? Here comes the hot mess, chapter five. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's, Wife, hot mess. And you are arrogant. Are you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that may, that, excuse me, that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There's that word. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of this world. There's no way to get away from that, right? 11, but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. All right, he's making a distinctive. Anyone who bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Everybody look at this. It is not the, it, it is is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? More tension. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you. All right. Father God, this is the word of the Lord. We believe that. Now encourage us, sharpen us, and show us the way forward as we live in grace and truth. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, now, can I just be honest this morning? This is a tough passage. This is a complex passage, and I'm gonna do my best to try to unpack it for you because I believe 
The reason is this is one of the most valuable, nourishing things that the church in America and the church in the world has to get a hold of. We have to understand this. So the first thing that I wanna point out is I told you Paul was gonna define reality. He was gonna define reality. He used a word, a phrase over and over again where he lifted it up and he used this phrase, the sexual immorality or the sexually immoral. He uses that five times uh, actually throughout this letter. And I just wanna give you the background here. The Greek phrase is the word porneia. It's where we get our modern translation, pornography. And it's the catch-all phrase for any kind of sexuality, all right, or any kind of sex outside of one man, one woman in covenant marriage. That's, I could make that case from the rest of the scripture. That's not where I'm primarily going today. We've got more conversation in chapter six next week, and you're gonna get me again next week for part two of this, okay? But I'm not going in all that space today. Come back next week. But I, I do want you to get a hold of this. Sexual immorality is the catch-all phrase. So this is men and women who are hooking up. This is, this. he'll talk about this uh, in chapter six. This is homosexuality. This is any kind of, any kind of sexual um, engagement that is outside of the covenant of marriage. That's because, don't have time to unpack this today, next week, that's because sex is about worship. Sex is about worship, and the way we do sexuality is about who and what we worship. I'll, I'll show you next week. But he's defining reality. Good fathers, good leaders, good pastors, not just guides, they define reality. And in the American church, we can't, listen, we can't have this kind of gradient, nuancy word salad where we don't call things that are immoral, immoral, and we don't point out sin that is sin. Are you with me? Now, here's what I need to make sure you get. This is not Paul's Twitter feed. This is not his Instagram. This is not his TikTok. This is not his YouTube channel. He is not yelling at the world. He is inside of the church and this is the locker room of God and he's having an honest conversation with brothers and sisters who call themselves born again believers and that's who's reading this letter. It is the gathered body. He's defining reality, but we've gotta make sure we understand the audience in which he's talking. You can't scream at the world for being the world. He makes that argument at the back of the chapter. And so it doesn't do any good, Christians, for us to holler and scream at the world for being the world. Now, what we have to do is we have to actually inverse it. Some of you are frustrated with Christians because they've screamed at the world while they have ignored their own sin. Paul's not willing to do that. So he's gonna tell them to love the world, but to address their own issues inside of the house. That's what he's doing. This is what the American church has to get a hold of. This is what New Spring Church has to get a hold of, okay? You with me? This has always been a problem in the church. It was a problem in Corinth. They had someone that needed to have the reality of the moment defined. Then he moves to an expectation of accountability. Now for this, I've gotta tell you a little bit of a story. Has anybody ever had somebody hold them accountable? Show of hands. Somebody held you accountable? All right, uh, I gotta tell you one. Uh, freshman year of college, I'm in Greenville and uh, uh, been there a semester. And I wanna tell you something that happened to me. I have PTSD till this day from this. Uh, it's around my alarm clock. Let me tell you the story. I played baseball at Furman and this is in our spring training. So we're not playing games yet. Uh, we're just getting ready. So we have 6 a.m. mandatory conditioning, running, working out, trying to get stronger, all of these things. Uh, my roommate and I, we really are rule followers. We're not out late partying. We're not doing any of that. So freshman year of college, we're in our loft, setting our alarm clock, getting ready to show up for practice the next morning. Uh, back in the day, some of you uh, Gen Z, you won't even know this world existed. We had phones that didn't have alarm clocks on them. All right, you had to set your alarm clock like, you know, and so we lived in a loft up top. We set our alarm clock down on the floor so you couldn't hit the snooze button, right? That's responsible. So I had one of those like red digital alarm clocks down there on the mini fridge in our little dorm room, set our alarm, went to bed. And then the weirdest thing happened. I woke up of my own just natural volition, just kind of, oh, that's great. And then all of a sudden I had that moment dawn on me where I, oh my God, why did, I didn't wake up till my alarm. And just immediately, I looked down at the, it was 5, 5, 6 a.m., never forget it, 5, 5, 6 and I knew we had to be in the strength and conditioning building at 6 a.m. And somehow we had slept through our alarm, missed the alarm, something was really bad wrong. And I went straight heart to my throat, panic mode, 
okay? Screamed at my roommate, Matt, get out, we're late. And we're throwing our clothes on. Forget about brushing your teeth, fixing your hair. We're sprinting across campus at Furman University and we blow through the doors of the strength and conditioning building as the team has just broken down the huddle and they're running to the positions inside of the, the weight room. So it's like, you know, family on three, family on three, one, two, three, family. Boof, and then we come psh, blowing through the door. Coach turns and he just blows the whistle. Everybody, put everything up. Let's meet down on the gym floor since Brad and Matt don't know what time workouts start. Here we go, right? This body language, okay? It was like a two minute walk and I, you know, your inner monologue is like, I'm an idiot. What kind of dummy doesn't go? Oh, ah. And then, then I'm really mad. Can I tell you why I'm really mad? I'm really mad at Matt because he set that alarm for PM instead of AM. I knew I should have just done it myself. You know, it's all that's going on inside of me. But then I make my mind up that if we're gonna have to run, then what's my expectation as one of the guys on the team is gonna run the gassers? Am I gonna be towards the front, the middle, or the back? Not just the front. I'm gonna be the first. I'm gonna win every sprint. That's what I'm gonna do. So that's my mentality. I'm just there. I put my foot on the baseline and coach says, no, 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 no. Brad and Matt, you guys come over here and sit with me. We're gonna watch your teammates run for you. That's what it felt like. Now yeah, come put your feet up, guys. Here's a cup of water. Watch your teammates run. All right, first gasser, let's do it, 20 seconds. And he's got a stopwatch. And he's looking at us, looking at them, you know, looking at us, looking at us. I could go into real, real intense detail here, but basically he, he uh, coaches us up pretty strong, but then he turns around and about, I don't know, 10 gassers later when the teammates are out there dying because of my mistake and my teammates' mistake, I look over and Matt's crying. <laughs> I am not joking. He transferred after that year. I hope he's well. I don't know where he is. <laughs> I'm still here having PTSD when my alarm clock goes off in the morning, but Matt, God bless you, brother. I hope you're out there doing well somewhere. About 10 gassers in, my teammates start screaming at me, right? Coach is saying, hey, captains, hey, seniors, hey, upperclassmen, hey, leaders, why don't you create and establish the culture you want to see of accountability on the team? And it worked. There was some accountability on the team. What I want you to see is that's a little bit of fun, but I want you to understand that's exactly, not exactly, even more than that, what Paul's doing with the church in Corinth. He actually as you open up the text and look, he, he defines the, the sexual immorality is sin. He says that, you've got someone in your church that's doing that and you guys are okay with that. But then he doesn't yell at this man. He doesn't spend the rest of the letter talking to this man. He spends the rest of his time talking to the other brothers and sisters and holding them accountable for their lack of confrontation. He spends more time saying, you are supposed to seniors, leaders in the church, Mothers and fathers in the church, we have got to do a better job of having godly, loving, grace and truth, conflict conversations inside of the house of God. Stop screaming at the rest of the city of Corinth. Start having conversations with men and women who say they're born again, but they're continuing to embrace their sin nature and at the same time going to the keggers on the weekend, sleeping with people they're not married to operating in swindler, bad business deals. They're abusing people in the business world. Now, again, he's definitely talking about sexual immorality here, but he's not letting the folks that are showing up at the Saturday tailgate getting drunk and showing up on Sunday morning at church calling themselves Christians, believing that that's okay. Feel the tension there? He's telling them we've got to lovingly address this. And so what I wanna say to you is we've gotta lovingly address it. Because it's, if we can't expect the world to see how we look different than them if we don't look different than them. It's actually, Frederick Nietzsche gets a lot of press for his worldview years ago. He actually had a really good Christian friend of his and he says, you're gonna have to look more redeemed if you want me to believe in your redeemer. And that's the issue. If we look like everybody else doing everything else, embracing all the things, and then we just blame, no, 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 grace, grace, grace. There's no judgment, there's no judgment, wrong. We hold both of these things in tension. Jesus said, yes, reserve judgment, but 
Paul also writes, by the same Holy Spirit, we are called to judge those inside the church. So this idea that we are a judgment-free zone in the house of God is a fallacy. It is a lie. It is called antinomianism. It is a bottomless grace that is powerless to transform people. And I just want you to know, everything in me has benefited from the fact that I've had Christians who love me and have grace and have truth and have held me accountable in spaces. And I want you to also see that it's what God expects of us. And it is a process. Let me drop a footnote here. The footnote is from the book of Matthew chapter 18. This is where Jesus actually tells people how to do Christian conflicts. You should go and read it later. He says, hey, go one-on-one. If somebody has done something sinful to you, go and, and bring it up to them. If they won't hear you, come with other brothers and sisters to them. And if they still won't hear you, bring it before the church And then he says this famous line, because where two or three are gathered, I am there with you also. Now we use that phrase all the time. Hey, two or three are gathered here at our morning uh, Hardy's biscuit breakfast. The Lord's here with us also. That's true. But the context of Jesus saying it was in Christian conflict and accountability. And so you need to know the spirit of the living God will be with you there as well. That's what Paul's referencing when he says, when my spirit is there and our Lord Jesus' spirit is there, bring this up when you're assembled. If somebody is continuing to say, I can live with my stepmom, having sexual intercourse with my stepmom and call myself a brother. It's okay. And if you judge me, you're wrong because bottomless grace. That's the exact conversation we're having here, okay? So now, third and final, he moves to a hope of reconciliation. A hope of reconciliation. And he, he has this crazy phrase that you probably saw. I'm like, what in the world does that mean? And uh, in order to do that, I'm gonna have to uh, pull out an umbrella because it is, after all, Master's Week. Master's Week. Uh, it was raining earlier this week. It's not raining today. It is beautiful today. It is. But um, uh, it is Master's Week, and it, you, wear an, uh, you wear an umbrella. You open up an umbrella so you don't get what? Rained on. One of the things that help us understand the church and Paul's heart of the church and what the church does for us is we've got to understand it keeps us from getting eroded by the acid rain of the world. Ephesians 2 tells us very clearly that there is a God of this world, it is Satan. At Easter, we celebrated it two weeks ago, Jesus took back the keys to the kingdom and he started to establish again that final kingdom of light where it is now, but it is also not yet. He's pushing back darkness. There's still darkness in this world. There's still fallen nature in this world. Listen to me. And the church has a role to play. The church provides a covering and protection from the world And if you grow in a culture and context of both grace and truth, where you're going to be held accountable, you're gonna be lovingly corrected, you're gonna be protected from the world's acid rain that'll tear you apart. And so what he actually says is if this man continues to reject correction, continues to reject biblical, loving, gracious, restorative correction, then give him to Satan and let him, and he, but he says it, he says, for a, for a hope of his salvation in the day of the Lord. So he, he, maybe way more than us, believes in the ability of the church to protect people, to grow people, to restore people, to see people come back from brokenness. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about the fact that Paul is speaking to people who are born again and are saved, and he's saying if they are born again and saved, they're gonna be growing up Now they're standing, they might have made some mistakes, they might make a mistake over a summer, might make a mistake over a spring break, made a mistake this week, we all make mistakes. This is, the reality of the church is it is a place where there are no perfect people allowed, but the reality of the church that Paul writes about is that it's not okay to stay that way, okay? So we're supposed to be on a trend line toward looking more like Jesus, transformation. We're supposed to look more like Christ, and if we are in the church, you're gonna be covered and protected, and so he says, this man wants the world, give him the world. Let him have the world. Don't let him continue to call himself a brother. Push him into the world. Now, practically speaking, pastorally speaking, that's very difficult. The actual word for that, that maybe you've heard of it before, is the idea of excommunicating. That's a very heavy word. But I want to show you what this might look like in the life of someone who has pastored people and has been corrected. I've, I've been on the other side of corrective conversations many times. But as a youth pastor for years, and I did that here at New Spring Church for over a decade, probably a handful of times, less than 10, 
I would have conversations with young men that I love specifically, and let me lay out their, their world. They're a believer. They maybe were born again at a, at a summer camp or they, they, they grew in faith and grew up here in church and claimed Christ to be their Lord. But then somewhere 15, 16, 17, they got their driver's license, maybe started playing on a ball team and maybe decided they were gonna party a little bit on the weekend. You know, the foot in both worlds thing. We've all been here, right? We've all been foot in both worlds. We all, right, honest. But in love, I'd have a conversation. Maybe their small group would come and talk to me or, or maybe I'd just find out. They're, they're a believer, but they're hooking up with their, their girlfriend. They're a believer, but they're, they're at the kegger, okay? And you could tell that they're miserable. And I'd sit down and talk with them and I'd just say, hey, let's be honest, okay? What's going on? Is this true? Is this true? You, you're a Christian, right? Yeah, but you want it. Okay, well, can I give you, instead of sitting on the fence, can I give you some advice? Now, what I'm about to tell you, listen to me. Prayerful and biblically affirmed by what Paul does here and what Paul tells Timothy to do in other place in his letter. Give them to, the, to, the, to Satan is what he says. Give them to the world. Uncover them so that they understand that what they really want isn't out there. I would say to a young man, I'd say, listen, if you really wanna pursue the party scene, if you really wanna pursue the sexuality scene, can I just give you some advice? Don't halfway do it. Why don't you go for it? Sometimes parents would look at me like, wait, you're telling my baby to go for it? Like, no, yeah, watch this. Pers run way after it. Because the sooner you get to the end of that party scene, that drug scene, that hooking up with that girl scene, that other sexuality scene, that alternative cultural lifestyle scene, the sooner you get out there and you drink deeply of the broken cistern that will not satisfy your soul, the sooner you're gonna realize that Jesus Christ is God's plan for soul satisfaction and the reason why you would follow him. But if you're living with your foot in both worlds, you're miserable. You might be here today and you're kind of like this and you're miserable. You know, let me tell you something. You might not have a lot of pastors tell you this, but I, I just showed you from the scripture. You need to run as hard as you can after that, that thing, that lifestyle, that sexuality, that drug, because here's the truth. There's no drug that the high is better than the high of Jesus that lasts. You come off the back, you crash, you're broken. There's no, there's no hookup scene or relationship scene or, or you know, one night affair or, or some kind of mistress relationship or some kind of ulterior sexuality that's gonna satisfy your soul. God's not trying to keep you from satisfaction and joy. He's trying to protect you. He's created the church to protect you and to grow you up. And the sooner you run after that and drink deep of the sand of the world, the sooner you're gonna come to Jesus and go, man, you really are the living water. You really are the living water. And so that's what's on offer. Now, let me say this before we close and begin to respond. I've had a, I've had a handful of these conversations through the years. And the truth is, and this is the scary reality, it's about 50-50. And the good news about this man in the book of 1 Corinthians, we find out in 2 Corinthians that he actually is restored. Here's the footnote, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses four through 11. Go read about Paul writing. He's writing another letter and he's talking about the man who's been restored, talking about the man who's been forgiven, talking about the man that walked through this, this discipline process. And now he's living in the, in the satisfaction of Jesus and the church. I've got a lot of young people that I love, that I've, that I'm looking for this kind of return to Jesus and the satisfaction that you can only find in Christ, okay? So I don't say this flippantly, that that's just something you, you should do flippantly. I say it with a warning, but Paul knew that out there in the world, you weren't gonna find satisfaction. And so he was confident in Jesus enough to say it like that. Now, let me invite you up to your feet and we're gonna enter into a time of response. And as you're standing, I want to emphasize response time. One of the reasons that we take so much intentionality right here at the end of our gatherings is because we have to have a culture and an ecosystem of restore, restoration and reconciliation. We have to have a grace-filled ecosystem. This is a moment of grace. This is a moment where we don't just have a truthy culture, but we have a gracious culture. So feel no shame today as you come to the Lord's table, Christian, and renew the covenant that Christ has died and broken himself and bled so that you might be a part of the family of God. Feel no shame today if you need to come and ask another brother or sister for prayer. Feel no shame today if you need to grab your spouse's hand and say, I need to talk to you about something after church today. Feel no shame this week if you need to reach out to some brothers or sisters and say, hey, I need accountability in my life. 
Um, because here's the reason. If, if we Christians see things that need to be corrected, we cannot be complicit with sins of omission. We've got to lovingly hold one another accountable. And 1 Corinthians 5 tells us exactly that. If you'll receive that, would you say amen? Amen. All right, I'm gonna invite our ministry teams to come and prepare our ministry spaces. And then I'm gonna pray and a pastor at your campus will come out and lead through this time. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for that picture of grace and truth, the tension that is upheld simultaneously by you, Christ, and by your word. Lord, we thank you for this, this good medicine that we've read about today that Paul gave to the church in Corinth where reality gets defined, but accountability gets established and reconciliation and hope is put on offer. Would you build, Jesus Christ, your alter alternative city in us? Would you make us that temple, that body that looks different, that shines bright in a dark world? And so God, as we enter into this time, we come to you again. Would you remind us that transformation happens where there's repetition. And so as we come again with confession and repentance, as we come again with the Lord's table, transformation is what we're after. That is the power of the gospel. And we don't wanna be a people just of talk. We wanna be a people of the power of the gospel, transformed lives. So do that now in Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, Brad. As we enter into a time of response, uh, we do that in five ways. We give, we, we participate in communion if we're believers. We can respond for salvation at the cross or prayer, um, and we respond in worship. And so as we're passing the baskets, I just want to share some personal testimony to encourage you. You know, the picture of that bridge that was on the back screen the whole time, like I burned that thing to the ground, like truly just took it all the way to the ground. And this church wrapped its arms around my family when I was not there to be the husband and dad that I should have been. The, our ushers sat my wife right back there when I wouldn't come to church with her. And uh, three guys, one of whom is sitting right here on the fifth row, came to my parents' house and sat down with me and said, hey, your life is a mess and you've got to decide to do something different. And over the course of the last 12 and a half years, this church has welcomed me back in with open arms because there is reconciliation here. Like there is grace to be extended here. And so I wanna to speak to two specific groups of people this morning. One, if you're that person and you're like, man, it's just, it's gotten sideways and I don't know why, I'd invite you to come pray with somebody and our, our rooms to the sides will be open so that you can go out and have a conversation um, and pray through something. And the other group that I feel specifically led to speak to is if you're one of those people who knows there's someone in your life that you need to have a difficult conversation with because you see something that they're either blind to or unwilling to acknowledge, I'd encourage you to come and pray for that person and begin the process of stepping into those conversations. I know they're not easy. I've had a lot of them over the last 12 and a half years but the fruit on the other side of a gracious presentation of the truth is beautiful. And so Father, right now we ask that you would give us the ability to recognize our need for you and Lord, the ability to graciously present the truth to those around us. And so now we're gonna pray together as we enter into this response time. And then I'm going to encourage you to respond as you feel necessary. So if we can put the corporate prayer on the screen. If you guys would pray this with me, Lord, we have heard your word and now we respond. We fix our eyes on the cross and fellowship at the Lord's table, remembering and proclaiming his death until he comes again. We lift our prayers to you, knowing you listen. We bring our tithes and offerings, trusting you to bless us and build the kingdom. And we sing, making a joyful noise that blesses your heart. In your kindness, lead us to repentance that we may be found faithful as we worship you with our whole lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You can respond as you feel led.
hands broken on the Just to honor you and bring you praise Like a fragrance broken on the floor May my worship be
attention, all my devotion, because you deserve it, because you are worthy, no one more worthy, all my attention, all my devotion, because you deserve it, because you are worthy, no one more worthy, all my Because you are worthy, no one more worthy All my attention, all my devotion Because you deserve it Because you are worthy, no one more worthy You are my portion, all my affection Because you are worthy all of us come on We are so glad you joined us today. As people respond in the room, I would love to lead our online family in a prayer for response. Wherever you are, out loud or to yourself, will you join me in this prayer? Lord, we have heard your word and now we respond. We lift our prayers to you knowing that you listen. We bring our tithes and our offerings, trusting you will bless us and build the kingdom. In your kindness, lead us to repentance, that we would be found faithful as we worship you with our whole lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you feel led to respond through salvation, prayer, or giving of your tithes and offerings, please text Church Online to 30303, and a pastor would love to connect with you. That's all from us this week. We hope to see you at one of our 13 campuses across the state of South Carolina or back here next week for Church Online. We pray you have a wonderful week and be blessed. <laughs>